Professor Manas. Uh, Derek came to this trust in 1993 uh, and uh, very soon established himself. He's got an incredible background story. Um, one day you might hear about it, but he's been in jail, he's been, uh, <laughs> he's been arrested, he's been charged with impersonating an army officer, he's done lots of things. And, uh, and I've heard most That's of it. That's not the worst of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. He runs, uh, he's got a band called Bad Manners, and um, he's, up, he's an all round good guy, I've got to say. And uh, he, when Joan went for an operation, he said, um, You'll hate me when I've done the operation, and then uh, afterwards you'll grow to love me. Well, she never did the hate me bit. <laughs> all right. So um, it gives me great pleasure to present um, Professor Derek Manners, the Director of Transplantation. Uh, and uh, the founder and creator of the Institute of Transplantation, the only one in the UK, I've got to say. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So, where did we say we go? This one. Uh, I, I don't know if you pointed at the projector or, or the um, computer, see if it does anything. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for coming and. Um, uh, it's been a while since I've done this talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the last time I did it was about four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, transplant matters. I don't know what that means. So, I'm going to talk about a few things that are changing in liver transplant. I've been doing liver transplant since 1985. I started in South Africa, then went to the States. Uh, when it was still an experimental procedure, and I um, brought my my I brought my skill to, the, to England, and we've changed things over the years. And I've been involved in lots of of the of the um, organisational things and the managerial things nationally. Um, so we've seen a lot of change. What's happened? What's the, mo the most recent change in liver transplant? Is that we've developed a, na a national. So right. see if it works. No. I'll just, uh, I'll just, uh, it's okay. All, All right. right. Um, uh, <coughs> what we've, what's happened is we've moved to a national offering system. So those of you in the room who've had a liver transplant, I can see one or two, um, when you had, when you were put on the waiting list, the decision to transplant you was based on um, a clinical decision made by us as the clinicians in the unit. Um, who else is waiting for this for our, in, in our in our centre? And how we thought the donor would suit you? And we could we would we had free reign, so the liver would be given to Newcastle, and we would decide who got it. And we did that for 20 years, and um, there was a lot of talk about trying to change it. And the problem with changing it was how do you change it? So. The Americans decided to use a, a system where they produced a score called a MEL score, which is a score based on how sick the patient was. The problem with this, that score is it doesn't really reflect who actually needs a liver transplant once it gets beyond a certain level or once it gets below a certain level. And so we weren't particularly happy with that. We created our own score called the UKEL score, but that still didn't reflect who needed a liver transplant. So if you had Debbie sitting in the waiting for a liver and Joan waiting for a liver to decide on a score between those two we thought was not acceptable because it didn't take into account the donor, how sick you were, uh, how long you've been waiting, where the liver was coming from. There's so many factors that determine what we should get it. And so we spent seven years, seven years, <laughs> developing this system which is called the, 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 the the National Liver Offering Scheme, and it's based on transplant benefit, uh, which I'll show you. Show you what transplant benefit is. But what is, this is, and it's only it's for for the moment. It's only on uh, for livers that come from donors who are brain dead. So the donors who come who come from the cardiac death, in other words, DCD, they're called. The, the donors whose heart stops, we don't use the system for at the moment because they're a different quality. So the system is up to this point the same as we currently have, people who are super urgent, children with 
a certain type of cancer called a bone and then patients who are either waiting for liver and lung or liver and heart. And actually, it's only the only center that does that is actually Newcastle. And then, and then from there, it's divided into two groups. This is a group of patients who've got chronic liver disease or hepatocellular cancer. And this is a group of patients with what's called variant syndrome, which is what you had, polycystic disease. The, because this is a type of disease where patients probably may not may not die from their disease in the near future, but they have a lot of uh, quality of life issues and they never get a showing. So it has to, we have to try and include those patients in, in this allocation system. And if no one accepts the liver after that, it goes to what's called fast track, so then every unit gets an option to take it, then overseas patients, European patients and overseas patients. That's how the system works. Unfortunately, just to show you while I've got this on, What's happened in Newcastle is we've been severely affected by this. Now, I feel kind of responsible because I was the, I was the architect of this. Um, but we knew Newcastle would be affected because we are the smallest unit and we have uh, the smallest waiting list. So the system does depend on how big the waiting list is. Um, and patients felt that it was the fairest way to do it. So what happens is, when there's a liver available, so, I don't know, someone's on the waiting list, waiting for a liver transplant. What happens is, their liver becomes available anywhere, I don't know, London. What the computer system does, is it looks at all the patients on the waiting list waiting for a liver transplant, so it looks at their survival while they're waiting. <coughs> it looks at their survival while they're waiting and then compares it to the survival with the transplant. And the only way you compare it to the survival with the transplant is to take the liver that's coming, because actually your outcome from a liver transplant depends on how good the liver is that you get. So if you get a very bad liver, you could have a very bad outcome. If you get a very good liver, then you have a good outcome. So it compares how long you've got to wait on the, liver, on the waiting list, compared to how, what your outcome will be if you get the liver that's currently being offered. And everyone on the waiting list gets scored um, from 1 to 500. And the highest score gets the liver, gets that particular liver. But each liver, the computer goes through the same process again. So every liver is identified for the right person within the whole country. It's a very, um, it's a very com complex computer program. I just certainly didn't write it. We have lots of very clever computer uh, computer scientists doing it. But what it does is compares that group of patients to that group of patients. So it's the difference between the survival on the waiting list and the survival of that particular liver transplant. And that's called the transplant benefit score. And that's what happens now. So in the past, we could choose a liver for a particular patient. We can't really do that now. Which for the clinicians, for us, is not so, you know, some clinicians still prefer to say, we know the patients, we know how sick they are, and we know what's good for them. The patient groups have said they don't want that, because if I don't feel good tonight, and there's a liver offer, and it comes for Joan, and she's high risk, I don't feel like doing it, then I'll say, well, I'm not doing it. I think we'll give it to someone else, it's easier. Now, there is no evidence that that happens. But human, is, human nature is human nature, and I can't say it doesn't happen, but you know, people do this job professionally, we spend all night doing this, why would we decide not to transplant someone who needs it? But there was a feeling that all other organs had gone this way, so we had to develop this. It's the only transplant benefit score in the world, and it's now being adopted by the Americans. It's, it's, um, so it is a very good score, but I do worry a little bit that centers like ours will not benefit. Just to look at what's happened last year, just to show you for, for interest, last year we did 1,069 liver transplants for the whole country. Um, and you can see that about 943 were from deceased bones. That was the first liver transplant. And 86 were re-transplants. So the majority of patients are, are first time transplants. These the retransplants are going down. The new score actually doesn't 
doesn't benefit people who need a retransplant, which we have to adjust, of course. Or not. We've only done 22 live donors for the whole of the UK, and that's going to be readdressed re again, unfortunately by me, but we've tried to do that before, but we're going back to, to consider it for the, the, what, the 2020 strategy, which is coming out from NHSBT. Um, and you can see uh, super urgent 84, those are patients who are pretty much got 24, 48 hours to survive. That number is significantly less than it used to be. So it used to be much higher than that. And that's largely because paracetamol is no more. Patients don't take paracetamol anymore because you can't buy it over the counter in huge doses, in huge amounts. The paracetamol was the biggest cause of, of acute liver failure. And then we did 74 children. And 17 multi-organ, which means that's liver, liver and lung, liver and heart, uh, uh, liver, pancreas, small bowel, all in one big cluster. So that's the current situation this is from last year. Just to show you the <laughs> demographics of patients being transplanted, if you just come to Newcastle, you'll see that the, the majority of patients we do, unfortunately, have alcoholic liver disease. Um, that's the theme across all the units, so it's still the commonest indication for a liver transplant in the UK, for alcoholic liver disease. You can see the hepatitis, hepatitis C, hardly exists anymore, it's gone, it's been treated, the drugs are amazing, so it's no longer an indication, and I'll come on to that to start. And then the other <coughs> indication is cancer, which is growing. 14% of our patients were cancer, 27% of the oral fluid. So, there's no question that most of the transplants being done now are for alcoholic liver disease or cancer. Or combination, in other words, you have cirrhosis and <coughs> cancer. We did a little bit of, I don't know if many of you know, but for, the, for 10 years we worked as a, as a collaboration with, uh, with Leeds and, um, and Edinburgh. And it was called the, New, the Northern Liver Alliance. So, for a long time in the north of England, we used to, we had a combined waiting list for patients who were sick. So anyone who's so I told you there was a score. The score is uh, de determines how sick the patients are. So anyone who had a score over 62 went on to a combined waiting list between Newcastle, Leeds, and um, and Edinburgh. And it was the first. I mean, it's been done in the states, but never been done in Europe because people couldn't collaborate. But we were able to collaborate. We did a good job, I think. We thought we were doing a good job for the patients. We thought that if you're sick, then you go onto one way unless you get a liver very quickly. And that's exactly what happened. So we used to call the patients who were very sick called top band patients. And um, over the years, uh, there were 359, over the 10 years, 359 patients who were transplanted urgently between the three units. And what we looked at was to see if we'd made any difference to the outcome. And what, it, what the results show is that actually the waiting time, this is the blue line, for people who were listed as one within this Northern Alliance, the waiting time was much, much shorter. So they got to live very quickly. Unfortunately, it didn't make a difference to the outcome. Now, we're not, so this is the paper published in Transplantation, but the, and if you read the whole paper, the, the, the conclusion was that actually other units were following suit without actually doing what we did. So in other words, each unit prioritized patients in a similar way. They didn't work as one team, but they started to prioritize their patients. So we compared units outside of our NLA, Kings and Cambridge versus Newcastle, Leeds and Edinburgh. It didn't make a difference to survival, but it did make a significant difference to how long you waited. Again, the concern, the, 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 we've always known that waiting on, on the length of time you wait doesn't always determine how long, uh, what your outcome is going to be. But, um, so this, this has now been published and it's, um, unfortunately with the new allocation system, we don't, don't no longer do this, which was a shame because it was a good collaboration. The other thing that's happening now is that um, we have lots of machines, and uh, Liver North are actually supporting a, a machine for us, which we'll show you just now. 
But, but um, one thing we don't have for patients in, in the liver failure is a dialysis, like a dialysis machine. So if you're going to kidney failure, you get put on a dialysis machine and uh, you can survive for a long time. In the liver, we've never had that. We've tried for many years. When I first came here, the professor of medicine called Oliver James got some money from a Japanese beer company, the Kirin Beer Company. I'm sure some of you drunk Kirin beer. Um, and they gave us they gave us a fair whack of money to develop a bioreactor, which is like a dialysis machine for the liver. But unfortunately, it never really worked. We used pig, pig liver cells, um, and we, we put it into a bioreactor with a barrier, so you couldn't transmit any pig diseases. But it was stopped, essentially, by the government because of the risk of zoonosis, which is infections you get from animals. And it never really took off. So. One of the things we, we thought we, we know is that actually there, there are quite a few livers that go that get donated that actually never get used to be for transplant because they're either not good enough or there's some problem with them and um, they can actually still do the job. You don't want to put it into someone because you're concerned that it won't they won't survive long term with it, but they may survive short term. So um, this is a paper from from a German, German center when they looked at taking a liver from someone, from either a human or a pig and putting it in a box and putting the patient's blood through it and then essentially using it as a dialysis machine, a liver in a box. And, and in the literature between 1964 and 2000, there were about 198 patients in the world who were, who were treated in this way. And some, I mean, some of them, some of them did very badly. But, um, but as in, in those days, you could just do that without really worrying too much. Now, <laughs> now you, you can't really do that. But, um, but the the criteria were that that they had to be under the age of 40. They had to be in coma in the ICU. They had to have acute liver failure. Majority of those P patients were hepatitis B patients. <coughs> and, and and they had a, a survival. I mean, which was which. Uh, that's, well, I don't know what happened there. But they had a, a survival, um, which was around about uh, around about fourteen percent, which is not bad for someone who's in bad coma. But actually, what happened after that was it all kind of disappeared and didn't really get picked up. Um, we know that we've been doing for some time. We've been doing uh, liver perfusion, so means we take the liver out of the donor and we put it on a machine and we make it work to see if it's going to work. And the reason we started doing that is because these livers, DCD, which are livers that come out of donors who are ready, uh, whose hearts have stopped, are particularly, are particularly um, prone to not working. So you get what's called primary non-function. If it doesn't work, then either the patient dies or you have to give them a new liver very quickly. So what we wanted to do was see how long we could keep the liver working on a machine and see if we could assess if it was going to work and so we could put it into patients. And this was one of the early studies we did. And it showed that we could keep the liver viable, don't worry about the graph, viable for up to 36 hours. Um, so, this is, this, so this was a study from, from, from Nebraska and they were the first center to actually do this in a formal way. And I think they used eight patients and eight pigs. And what they did was they put the liver into this circuit. This was an oxygenator. There was a blood reservoir, and that's a patient. And so the blood went through the liver into the patient and back to the oxygenator. And they kept the patients going uh, for a fair amount of time. And I think of the, of the 12 patients that ultimately got this treatment, <coughs> 14 that got the treatment, 12 survived. A lot of patients didn't survive um, because they didn't they weren't eligible for the treatment. But what you can see is that all the patients this is this is a matter <coughs> which, is, which is a marker of, of encephalopathy, which is coma following liver failure. And you can see that all the patients who are treated uh, have managed to reduce the encephalopathy rate. And a significant number of patients came off their blood blood pressure support, which is a good sign. And so what's happened in Newcastle is we've taken, uh, gone back, looked at that data and decided that 
perhaps it's time just to re-energize that with all the new machinery we have. So as you know, Liver North have bought a, or helped us fund their Organox. Organox is a machine, I'll show you what it looks like, but it's a machine that was developed in Oxford and it is, uh, a, a, the liver is put onto the machine in a closed circuit and basically it functions for up to 36 hours without being transplanted. And so this is the system where you don't have to live in, it's very it's a bit complicated, but basically we had to use this system for patients who are in acute liver failure. When there's no option of a liver coming, or if they're not transplantable, so it can be either a bridge to transplant, waiting for a liver, or rescue therapy, in other words, people who've had a liver and it's failed and we need to try and get them to the next stage. Um, and so that's the system we use. It's now been, it's gone through all the ethics um, and it's been approved. And when we look back at the, at the, the data we had, there were 22 patients who we identified here in Newcastle um, who had evidence of multi-organ failure and liver failure, and only three got a liver through the organ allocation system. So in other words, all the other patients that didn't get a liver either died or spent a long time in ICU. So 10 patients died during the admission, 12 were survived with a long ICU stay. So potentially we could, we could have used, we could have treated those 10 patients. When we looked at the number of livers available, there were 158 livers in the country that weren't used, that were taken from, that people donated that weren't used. So there's a lot of livers available for this, for this service. So, We've now been given the go-ahead from NHSBT to be the first centre to do this. That's the team that are going to be doing it. Um, and we've been through all the means of the ethics. Uh, we've been through uh, the, the, the PPI panel. Um, we've been through everything else, the advisory group, the regulatory authority. So it's all been approved now. So it's ready to start. We're getting the organ in June, so... And we have an external review panel, which is made up of people from around the country. Um, so, so that's that's extracorporeal liver perfusion. That liver is going to work for a couple of days, and then hopefully the patient will recover, or we get a liver to transplant. Um, why do organs fail after transplant? And um, it's uh, most of them function normally in the donor. So why do we take them out? We wouldn't be taking out a liver that's not functioning normally in the person who's donating it. So why do they fail when we take them out? So one of the big problems is how you preserve them. So from, for about 100 years, for about, uh, since 1958, we've been preserving organs in a box of ice. And that's exactly, exactly what it looks like. That is the box of ice that we put the liver into. Um, and it's easy, very easy to do. You open the lid. You make a hole in the ice and you put the liver in. After it's been protected, obviously, you don't just put the liver straight in the ice. <laughs> it's very quick to do and it's transportable. I can put it in the boot of my car. I mean, I've done it years ago, but not anymore. And it's extremely cheap. Those boxes cost about 70 pounds. Um, the problem with this is that uh, when you cool down an organ like that, you cause lots of damage to the cells. You don't give it any oxygen, so without oxygen it's sitting in a state of suspended animation and some organs cope with that and others don't. It accumulates a lot of really toxic, toxic <coughs> uh, um, substances which once you put the blood back into it, it spreads all around the body and makes people really sick. And you can't assess whether the organ's going to work, you don't know, it's in a box of ice, you take it out, it's freezing cold, you put it into someone and you warm it up. Now, it stood the test of time for us, but actually, that was when we chose only donors who were perfect. So the young 27-year-old guy who came off his motorbike, ended up with a brain injury, and became a donor. We don't have those donors anymore. They don't exist. No one comes with their bikes. No one crashes their cars, and if they do, they've got seatbelts. So the donors we have for all in their 60s and 70s, they all have uh, fatty liver disease, unfortunately, and uh, they all they all got lots of comorbidities. So they've had blood pressure problems. They got crunchy aortas. They all spread sick people. So <coughs> now we're taking the liver out of them, expecting this to work for someone else. 
So that's why we need to really be um, mindful of how you're trying to assess the liver. I don't know what's happened there, whatever. So what happens now in the retrieval, certain centers, we don't do NLP at the moment, but NLP is like um, a cardiac bypass machine, so you take it out to the donor. And you put them on the cardiac bypass and you oxygenate their livers. And then what's that? You take the liver out and then you transport it. And, we, and the transport device is called the organ ox, which I'll show you. That you put it from the donor into the organ ox, you put it onto the, into the car and you drive it back to the center. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Or what we do is take it out the donor, the recipient of the donor, and then we reperfuse it in, in the theater. So those are the ways you can do it. And it's become uh, what's called machine perfusion. And machine perfusion is either cold, so you can use cold solution, which is like a blood substitute, or you can make it warm. Normal thermic means the, the temperature of you guys sitting in the water. And usually we use that with blood. This is the cold perfusion system that was developed in, in New York. And we use this, we've done about 30 cases now here in Newcastle, it's easy because you don't have to worry about the temperature and the infection and all that risk because you can keep it cold, but you give it up, give it a little oxygen. And that's the difference between just putting it in a box of ice. So that's oxygen, cold perfusion. And that just shows you that actually in that center they've done really well with it. But the most important thing about preserving organs that's changed since I was a boy is oxygen. So we never thought giving oxygen was important, but now we know it is very important. Um, but anyway, so what we do now is we try and recreate the, the physiology of the donor in a machine. So we give oxygen, we, give, we, we control the temperature, we give nutrition, um, and then we allow the liver to work in the normal way. And in that way, we can assess whether that's going to be a good organ to use. And if it's not, we don't use it. So then we don't put people at risk of taking higher risk organs that are not going to work. That's a liver on a perfusion device. That's before, and then you can see the blood going through it nice and pink. Just to show you. Um, and this is this is an organ that we did for 24 hours. And actually, we were never going to use this because came from someone with, a, with a hepatitis C and we weren't going to use it. But just to show that for 24 hours, it still looks pretty good once you cut it up. So the machine is safe and it works very really well. This is the machine that you bought for us, or helped us by. This is called an organ ops. It looks a big, it's a big machine, it's not a small thing. But it shows you, I mean, it's, it's very automated. So the one thing you do is what the liver's in here. Once the liver's in, that's, that's it. You close up, you put the cover on, and, and you look on your, on your mobile, on your, on your phone, and it gives you all the figures. So you can go home and be at home, and you can just check how the liver's doing while you have a little bit of sleep or a bit of food. Or, um, so there's been a big trial done in Europe called the COPE trial, um, which shows that it's safe. And uh, it wasn't a trial done for efficacy, it was done for safety. So. Um, you can put you put it on these wheels. You can wheel it around, and actually you can take it in a in the van. So we're not going to do that. That's a bit of a pain. So that's machine perfusion. The other problem I spoke about is this. This is fat. This is fat in your liver, and it's a big problem. It's probably the biggest public health problem we have now. Hepatitis C is gone. HIV is treatable. Um, there's a lot of work being done on alcoholic liver disease, but no one seems to care about this. So everyone, everyone has got this problem. And what we didn't realize was this, this actually comes more with a lot of issues. One of us can produce cirrhosis, and so it's becoming a bigger problem. And the second problem is which we described in Newcastle as the first center we described. The first center, so we described this I can't remember when it was done. 2014. Well, the first center to describe this that fat causes inflammation in the liver, which produces hepatocellular cancer. So, obese people with fatty livers have a much higher risk of developing hepatocellular cancer. 
So now, in the past, people with cirrhosis had to be screened, and now actually we've got fatal liver disease, you have to be screened. And, uh, and many, many more centers now have described this, this. That was the first, that's our paper, the first paper to publish. Um, the one but last. This is the next next thing. So now because hepatitis C is no longer an issue, because uh, paracetamol is no longer an issue, um, the number of patients that, that need transplants nationally is changing. So we're doing more people with benign disease, and we're doing more people we think we need to do with cancer. So there are three the big cancers that we can we do we do transplant for. It's pretty safe for one time. So these are the cancers we transplant for. Paracetamol carcinoma, that's the one we do regularly. And patients have to fulfill the criteria, but even that, we're moving outside the criteria. Hepatoblastoma is a, is a cancer of children. It's like a hepatoblastoma cancer, but it's in children. Hemangiopathia endothelioma is, um, is, a, is a vascular cancer. And with those three, you can transplant now. We all would do that. They all have to meet certain criteria, so we limit the way they get on the way to us. Cholangiocarcinoma is a cancer of the bile duct, and we currently don't transplant that in this country. They do in lots of other countries, and we're now moving towards doing that. And then neuro, neuroendocrine tumors, which we did for some time, and then we stopped because the outcomes were bad, um, except in certain patients who had uh, what's called endocrinopathy, so they're patients who produce lots of hormone. Um, they did okay. And we've had, we did three or four patients who did quite well. But generally, around the world, they didn't do well, so it was stopped. But now we have criteria for that. So those are the cancers that we think we should be transplanting. I mean, in reality, in Europe, actually, 16% of patients are transplanted for cancer outside of just hepatocellular cancer. So lots of patients, but you can't read this here, but metastatic colorectal cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, so we are way behind the rest of the world. Um, this is the uh, criteria for hepatocellular cancer that's expanded beyond what we do now, and this is the UK, the UK criteria. So up to now, we can only transplant less than five centimeter tumors. We now move to five to seven centimeters with a, a six-month review to make sure that it doesn't expand, and up to five tumors. So that's quite a, quite a big step. Compared to the rest of the world, they, they are quite um, much more aggressive, but we will take, we'll get that. You know, the British they have to be conservative. Hyalocalangio, this I think um, will become the next, and we just, through the Energist BT, I do, I do have a small job with Energist BT. But we, um, we are writing a new uh, protocol for this, so this will happen quite soon, I think. Um, and that just shows that in, this, in the Mayo Clinic, where they started this, 76% fire survival. So if you operate on these patients and not transplant them, your chance of getting fire survival is about uh, 16%. If you transplant them, we're getting 76%. And we do a lot of resection for this disease. Actually, uh, last year we were one of the biggest centers, so we've done about 130 resections for this disease, and most of the patients um, are not alive in five years. So, you can, if you choose the right patients, you can get an outstanding outcome. So, we're moving towards that. This is the the other intrahepatic cancer I want to get to that. And then the other big issue is colorectal cancer, and colorectal cancer is very common. 50% of people who develop cancer of their colon get this spread to the liver. And actually, only 10 to 20% of people can have an operation. So, why are we not transplanting these patients? And they, we get asked this all the time. Every time we see a patient in the clinic, they say, can't we have a transplant? Well, one of the problems is, which one of these is all patients with colorectal <coughs> cancer spread to the liver? Which one would you give a transplant to? That's the problem. And if you give it to someone like that, then it could spread everywhere. If you give it to someone like that, I don't know, it's involving the abdominal wall. If you give it to someone like that, it's involving the vena cava, it means you're going to, how you're going to put the liver in. So they are quite complex decisions. So uh, again, we are making, um, this is the study from Norway. In Norway, they have 
they have livers that coming out that's growing on trees. They have more livers than they know what to do with because they don't have a population of a big population of chronic liver disease. So they've been transplanting this disease for a long time. And you can see you can see the outcome. That's the outcome of patients. This is the past experience and that's the new experience. And they have very good outcomes. So again we're moving towards looking at that. And then this is neuroendocrine disease, which you know a lot about. And, and these patients are patients who have tumors that produce hormones and can really bone up their lives. And so they're the ideal to transplant. So that's all happening in the near future. And then finally, the consent issue. So what's happened in NHS BT is we've decided that every unit is going to consent to patients with liver transplant in the same way. Because if you go around the country, everyone does it in a different way. Patients get educated differently. Um, some people, in some centers, they bring the patients to, a, to a, a room like this, and they educate them about liver transplant, and then they consent them afterwards. Other places just educate them in the ward. Other places consent them and educate them at the same time. So that's not really acceptable. So what we've done is we've changed it. So this is, this is what it's going to look like. You have to read it all. This is what it looks like. It's going to be the headline things that you have to tell patients in the beginning. And then the core information they have to know if they're going to sign a consent form. And then if people want to know more, then they go beyond what they need to know. But there has to be an option for them. And this is all going to be online. And uh, that's, uh, I, I chaired this, uh, this group. And what we're going to do now is it's going to, along with that consent, it's going to be films about consent. So we're going we're gonna to show physicians how to take consent properly. Um, one of the films we're making actually is about consent. So that's Lewin also given us the money for. It's about how to do it properly. Because actually consenting patients and giving informed consent, there's a, there, there's a question about what is informed consent. Is it a flat jacket for the doctor or is it actually informing the patient? Um, and informed consent can, can become overawing for patients if they hear all this information all the time. So it has to be given in stages and in sound bites and different ways, visually and in written documentation. So we're going to make a lot of films and some of them are going to be on Transplant TV. Don't forget Transplant TV, which is online. You can look at it now if you want. So those are all the things I thought would be interesting for you. Very good.